to be with you again and uh, for the ninth year. And one of the exciting events in my life and my wife, Anna Maria's life, is that we've never actually given the same presentation twice. So in the first year, nine years ago, Anna Maria and I in New York City, uh, second year in Long Island, the first year, basically conducted the entire Real Truth About Health alone. And Stephen, who we have great admiration for, because without Stephen, this would not be existing. And all of you around the world wouldn't be getting these jewels of information from truth tellers. Uh, literally was told by Anna and I, we know a lot about a lot of things, but we don't know a lot about everything. So that's when we started to expand. And I'm so proud to be part of a 17-day conference. I'm so proud of documenting state-of-the-art progressive healthcare from people who are practicing this on the front line. This is not something we've read in books. These are scientists, thinkers, and doctors who basically are employing progressive healthcare on a daily basis, and from that learning, gleaming what works and what doesn't. So this year's presentation, like all others, I delved in the last six months into the bacterial count of the intestinal tract. You hear an awful lot about that today, but one of the things that we're missing is what does it do and what do you have to put into the intestinal tract? Was there science that could support what should be eaten? And what are the fuels that actually feed healthy bacteria? Hold on, because a lot of this data is as fresh as three months ago. You're going to be shocked. Another way we can prove a plant-based diet is in the human species. So we're going to take a voyage right now into your intestinal tract. We dolled it up a little bit. As you see, there's a lot of different colors. I'm not sure that's how everyone's look. But at the same point, I would hope it is. And as you see, your inside is you. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, quite simply, who you are, who you present yourself as, your persona, is your emotional and physical being. So that's what I'm saying to you, that your inside is literally who you are, because that's what creates your emotional and physical person. Isn't that amazing? And I didn't learn that in school, and I don't know of any doctor ever in the history of medicine that learned that in school. Now, the amazing part of this story, we're going to go right back on a voyage more than three and a half billion years ago. I didn't say million. I said billion years ago. And the earth was completely covered by water. There was no life as we know it. Can you imagine that? Nothing existed that we can identify today as life. And something quite unique happened in that water. The sun came down, and before you know it, it created a bacteria. So the bacteria was the very first life form on the earth, but it wasn't life as we know it. As a matter of fact, it was what we call anaerobic. Anaerobic means it does not require oxygen. Now, one of the simple ways to put life as we know it all life as we know it require oxygen. So this is really a great story. So here this lifeless, oxygenless bacteria morphed uh, about one billion years later. So now we're talking about two and a half billion years ago into what we call today, and I take every day as I did this morning, along with four others, algae. In this case, it's blue-green algae. It's cyanobacteria is what it's scientifically called. This bacteria was the first to utilize photosynthesis. Now, we all remember that big word from grade school. Photosynthesis is where the sunlight comes down and the photons that actually come from the sun itself that were protons before they projectiled into the atmosphere of the universe and got to move so rapidly, they turn into light. It actually hit the first life form, which was blue-green algae, 
producing photosynthesis. Now, we remember the rest of that story because photosynthesis is what creates oxygen, O2. Great story. Now we talk about billions of years later, land came and new biomes. So new life forms came. That's what a biome is. And this is an amazing event that happened. The very first thing that occurred, there were all these continents. We believe about four continents that were together. Through time and the spinning of the earth in our universe, they began to separate, a very slow, laborious process. And what popped up was the island and continent of Australia. So the very first land, a million years before any other land, was the island and continent of Australia. Now, the algae, which was microscopic, created in the ocean next to it, a visible form of algae. Today, we may call them things like nori that you put on plant-based sushi. You may find arami, haziki, wakame, dulse, many of the things I eat and we serve here at Hippocrates Health Institute. But then that invisible algae created grass. So the very first thing that grew on land was grass. So this is why for the last 66 years, We've been very mono-focused on making sure that everyone take these fundamental and foundational life forms into their diet. And that's not all we eat because we're most familiar with organic vegetables and plants and nuts and seeds and grains and beans, and they're perfectly good. But without the fundamentals, you're really missing an awful lot. From that grass came everything from the plants that are in your garden, as we look outside, or if you're listening to me as you drive, as you drive by, to redwood trees. And some of the biomes are aquatic, which was the original grassland, which we're now talking about, that emerged into forest, and then deserts and tundra. So these are the five basic life-sustaining environments. Now, what is a microbe? So we started by saying that over three and a half billion years ago, an oxygen-less bacteria was created. That was the first microbe. And by the way, that gave birth to the very first living vegetable or living plant, we should say. And as you notice, these are actual films with an electron microscope of microbes in the body. Now, the surprising thing to most of you, when you see somebody really attractive and you say, wow, they're really beautiful, they're really cute, they have 10 times more bacteria than they have cells in their body. So you may think the second time, but they still may be cute after that. So microbes are literally microscopic biology that are all around us, not only us, but all around us. They live in water, soil, and in the atmosphere that we breathe. The human body is home to billions and billions and billions of these microbes and also microorganisms. Some microbes make us sick. Others are important to maintain health. Now, this is really beautiful. It's a dance between having adequate amounts of healthy microbes and making sure that the immunity is so strong that it prevents an overgrowth of bad bacteria. As a matter of fact, until recent lifestyle diseases, that is the number one cause of death today, that we've created through eating animals, breathing pollution, wearing polyester, nylon, synthetic clothing, and the list goes on, having bad relationships, hating your job, most people died in years past from microbes. And one of the greatest findings in history was antibiotics. But boy, have they gone bonkers on that one. And it's become counterproductive rather than productive to human health and survival at this point. What is a microbe? 
So we always say microbe bacteria, but it's also a fungi, a protozoa, a virus. There's so many components to this biome of little, little microscopic creatures that literally are either after you or, by the way, supportive of you. The number of genes in a person's microbiome are 200 times the number of genes in the human genome. Now think about that. We're all excited today, and I am too, because I think one of the greatest things I've seen in my lifetime that came out of modern science and modern medicine was genetics. But think of what I'm telling you. We're just beginning to explore this. This is like we've gone to another planet we've never seen before, and we've been speculating until very, very recently the significance that this microbiome has in your body and our connectivity to the universe around us. But think of this, we're gonna to have to study 200 times more about the genes that are in your intestinal tract than we do the genes that make up who you are at this point. The microbiome may weigh, to, weigh as much as five pounds. Think about that one. Now here's where we begin a voyage into why we're all sick as dogs. Now, every word I will ever utter, not only have I seen here in a clinical setting at Hippocrates and learned over the last 52 years of my work, working with 287,000 people, but it's also supported, as you see at the bottom of your screen, by current and valid science. Lacking in diversity. A lot of you say, oh, diversity is a good thing, but boy, oh boy. You're lacking in diversity. Western intestinal for fauna and flora are up to 30 times less diverse than non-Western intestinal microbiome. Now think about that. So we have one third less healthy, good, strong bacteria than people who live much like they did hundreds or thousands of years ago. Now, of course, we're the sophisticated ones. We're the ones who are sterile, and we're the ones who are clean, and we're the ones that are sick. We're so sick to remind all of you out there listening around the globe that the number three killer in the developed world happens to be modern medicine. And by the way, the number one killer in great part is caused by modern medicine. It's cancer number one, heart attacks, strokes number two, and pharmaceutical drugs and medical mistakes, number three. Now, do you think that may, just may have something to do with one third of your healthy bacteria not being there? And why aren't the healthy bacteria there? I alluded to it just five minutes ago. Antibiotics have saved billions of people's lives because it was killing bad bacteria. But because they've made very little headway in modern medicine, with medicines, well, the headway, as you see, uh, they've made is that most of them are suspect of creating disease and even death. That's why every ad globally, you'll hear them actually either utter or in writing, tell you all the side effects from taking these drugs that kill the microbiome. Aha. Uh -huh. You think maybe eating fast food that is riddled with pesticides, fungicides, herbicides, plastics, fillers, and genetic modified organisms may be killing the healthy bacteria. Well, put that in the back of your mind because we're gonna keep going up this step until you see there is a remedy. I want you to look at this. This goes back to 1850, right up to the future, 2050, a one century period. Now, look there, and you're going to see the different colors. The yellow are populations. They're beginning to modernize. They haven't quite gotten as ignorant as we do. They're not living in a cesspool of deadly chemicals and eating fast food. They're not sitting and watching Netflix all day long and thinking that's entertainment. They still exercise. They still farm in great part. They still go outside for entertainment, they walk, and they do all the things that everyone did for the entire history of the human race. So they're just beginning 
to go downhill. And so that's the line at the very, very top. And you see that really is only starting now around 2020 or so. The second one is current uh, with modernization. So these are countries, for instance, like Germany and France and England and Australia and Japan and the United States and Canada, and I can go on and I can go on and go down. You know, these are currently doing that. And you're going to look at what that red looks like. So they started to do this uh, about in the 1960s, 1970s. And that's when we started to see health plummet. Uh, that's when I began my work in 1971. And I can tell you, I would often see what I would consider healthy people. Our medical team would be doing reports on them. It's rare I find one or two a year I can put in the same category I did as short ago as 1970s. Now, the inventor of modernization of the planet, let's give ourselves a hand here in the United States, America! And there's the blue. Of course, I used blue for that intentionally. We started to plummet around the Industrial Revolution's invention. Now, the Brits did not, lose, did not win uh, the revolution, but they got us anyway, because they invented industry within a matter of five to 10 years after that, America robbed it and became the industrial giant that created the economy of the United States. So whenever you say, God loves America, and that's why we're strong and we're healthy and we're prosperous. It's because we polluted the very land that was helping to actually destroy the second largest way we collected money, agriculture. We were the breadbasket of the world. So why we became the country we have been, and I say have been, is because we brought industry here. And by the way, we had enough food, not only for our citizenship, but to export globally. Now, that's not the same story anymore. And that started here in 1860, 1870. And look at where we are now in 2022. And now we have choices. If you look there, reversing through restoration. Do you think we're going to put the brakes on completely? Do you think we have leadership in the world? that's even interested in what we're talking about, the survival of the human race, the health of their families, their friends, and the citizenship of the globe? No, they're not interested in that. They're interested in power and money. So we had good leadership, and if healthcare was healthcare, not pharmaceutical distribution, we may want to reverse. And if we don't reverse, we have a problem. The second option we have is we arrest the decline. We just stop being idiots. And some of you are attempting that. That's why you're sitting here listening to me on the real truth about health. But are you doing enough? Because most of you are just happy being moderate and eating you know, soy burgers and singing Kumbaya about how great it is to be a plant-based eater. But it's not enough, I can tell you that. We may arrest it if we get about 25 to 30 times more people doing what we are doing now, even if you do it wrong. But I suspect, and I would vote, and I would actually bet that the last one is going to be the way we go, future decline. So here we are, 100, and 100 years, and you saw the decline. And when I take this and match it up with health disorders, Many of these health disorders did not even exist 100 years ago. Diabetic type 2 conditions, non-existent. Cancer, such a small issue, it was less than 5% of the people got it. Heart attacks and strokes, less than 10% of the people got it. And so if you compare today to 57% of us during our life contracting some type of cancer, that half of us dying from heart attacks and strokes, and sadly, you are now taught to be dependent on a healthcare system that's the number three killer. I'm not sure what the outcome's gonna look like. It doesn't look pretty to me, I can tell you that. So we're brewing competition. I'll tell you how a good body that's actually supported works. So researchers 
uh, like Becking, actually coined a term, a hypothesis, that everything is everywhere, but the environment basically rules and selects. So we're so arrogant, human beings, we write books and we follow the books and we create religions around the books, et cetera. And we say, we rule the world, we rule the creatures, we rule the women, all of that's nonsense, all of that's baloney. We are ruled by the biology, the microbiome in our intestinal tract. And by the way, the biology around us, we are formed in the image of Earth's biology. Let me repeat this so you may understand what I'm saying. It's almost like we're this raw, beautiful piece of marble and the environment, the microbiome in your intestine and connecting to the biology outside of us basically is Michelangelo who has a hammer and a chisel and he's forming you into, by the way, who you become. Now, by the way, if you've been eating nonsense food and under stress and not moving and not exercising, you have a Michelangelo that, by the way, is drunk. And so he's taking big chips out of your body. He's destroying you. He's killing you. And you're saying, I don't know what's wrong. Well, I know what's wrong. You are arrogant. And you basically think that you are ruling the universe and the rule universe is ruling you. Our bodies employ two methods in selecting the bacteria passaging through the system. And we're going to show you what that looks like. Nutrient availability plays an essential role and has an enormous influence shaping the microbiome. So now here's where we start to talk about nutrition. Next week on Saturday at one o'clock, I'm really going to get down to it. I'm going to give you the, the dirty science, the, the clear science on why eating these things destroy your health. But today we're going to show you the end result of it. So I'm doing this backward, actually, in reverse. So if you don't have nutrition, you cannot have healthy bacteria. Because think of healthy bacteria as little people. I don't know, they probably are more important than we are. And imagine if I took you and said, I'm going to lock you in the closet for four months and I'm not going to give you any nutrition. I'm just going to give you good water. At least it's good water, right? When I open the door, I'm going to find a person who is demise. No question about it. So if I am equating a healthy bacteria in your intestinal tract as a person, they need to have nourishment just like you do. This is generally what we nourish our bodies with. Uh, let me preface nourish with big quotes around it. Dietary diversity is basically non-existent. Economic pressure to greater food production, because now we have, compared to 1920, 2 billion people. Now we have over 8 billion, bordering on 9 billion people. So a lot more food production. But by the way, what they're producing is not food. Now, if they started to eat plant-based foods, we'd have enough food for 50 times more people than we have on the earth right now. And... We call these beige foods. That was my entire diet. There was nothing exciting in any of that food. The rare time I ate a vegetable at my family's home, it was cooked to a point it looked beige at that point. So the methods and growing population craving these dangerous, unbelievable non-foods. Agriculture, both plant and animal, and the preference of pesticides and antibiotics have effectively destroyed our body's immune boosting intestinal bacteria. Now, this is the first time I'm bringing you into why this is so important. We've mentioned the word, or the words, I should say, immune system. Now, that's where all of your immune system comes from. Over 80% of your immune system comes from a healthy bacteria in your intestinal tract, your fauna and flora. If you have a lot of unhealthy bacteria, what do you think that does to your immune system? Well, here are these little beautiful villia that are actually like hula dancers, as you notice. Well, let's do this. If you're not driving, let's go back and forth. This is the exercise period of the program. <laughs> you know, basically, 
they move back and forth, pushing, hopefully, plant-based organic raw food through you. And that's what they're built to do and meant to do. Now, can you imagine if you put the pasty food, the beige food, the overprocessed food, the chemicalized food, the animal food in? This sticks inside between these villi. And you end up having to detox an awful lot. I know when I started to detox, back when I was a 20-year-old young man, I thought I was literally going to die with what was coming out of me. Because I never ate anything that had any relevance revel to, to nutrition. So what is microbiomes responsible for? So here we are. Are you sending mixed signals? Now, all I know is every single thing I put into my intestinal tract and those villia were pushing it along and sucking nutrition out of it. There was no nutrition to suck. So the message I was actually giving my immune system was I'm going to starve you. I don't like you. I don't respect you. And believe me, it works because I'm sitting here every day and helping people who end up with catastrophic disease who didn't even know they were disrespecting their immune system by eating stuff, not food. When a microbiome is flooded with energy in the form of undigested and partially digested foods, and I say foods with quote, and in some cases drugs, conflicting messages reign. Now, can you imagine putting a drug into the body when the villa pulls that up rather than a nutrient, and it's supposed to be nourishing the human cells of the body and activating the immune system, what happens? Well, it starts to intake the drug and attempt to use it as it does nutrition, and obviously it's not nutrition. So you have misguided energy, and we'll get to that a little bit later. Each of these elements sends signaling messages about food intake, and the state of digestion to your entire physiological, and now we enter the second psychological system. Aha! So I'm going to now prove to you over the next few minutes that your psychology and your biology depends upon eating plant-based foods more than any other single factor. This is no longer subject to challenge. This is no longer speculation. This is no longer hypotheses. This is confirmed. Now, you may not like what we have to say, or you may be open-minded and really wanting to become your maximum best. So please follow through with me. I started to recognize a number of decades ago what was going on. Now, the signals come from proteins. We knew that Robel back in 1999 won the Nobel Prize, by the way, when he showed us that how cells communicate with one another in anatomy, meaning or liver uh, talks to the gallbladder and the heart speaks to the brain and all of these different things happen is through protein signaling, going back and forth. Now, enzymes, which are incorrectly taught at university, uh, are only taught to be proteins. But what their real job is to come in and break up nutrition, including proteins. And when an enzyme comes in and literally starts to emulsify, break up the protein shell, the messaging becomes, as you see, systematically enlarged. So the equal sign means different forms of messages coming from one protein. Now let's go back and revisit what I said two minutes ago. Imagine if you're not getting nutrition, but you're getting drugs. Imagine if you're eating the way that I did at one point in my life. Everything was chemicalized. Everything was sugar. Everything was non-nutritious. So now when the enzyme comes in to break these elements and proteins up, there is a complete confusion within the human system. And do some of you feel that? You're not congruent with your body? Oh, I don't feel I can fit. I don't feel I can move. Yeah, this is why. Because you've literally been not only starving your body of nutrition, but information. Now, here's how it works. This all begins in the intestinal tract with these messaging. 
Remember, 80% of immunity comes from there. And literally, you look at your spine. Now, you have something called a neurological system. And that, believe it or not, as funny as it sounds for the non-scientists here, until the late 1990s, we used to think the brain completely controlled the rest of the body. The brain was sort of the puppeteer, and the body followed what the brain wanted. Thank God, a group of out-of-the-box thinking good scientists said, no, wait a minute, the body talks to the brain too. So when we see this messaging going up the entire spinal cord in the neurological system, the nervous system with neurons into the brain, equally it comes back down. And this is why many times you have an intent intellectually to do something, but your body's not following through with it. And most of the time, the congruency is not there because you're not giving yourself consistent positive messaging because you're not putting into your body the required nutrients. Now, most of you say, well, I know the required nutrients are proteins and vitamins and minerals and essential fatty acids and all of this stuff. And that's great. But once you process and once you cook a food, they are basically unable and incapable of giving the right messaging because there's an electromagnetic charge that's required the energy within living food to give proper notoriety and messaging. The gut brain axis. Now we take a deeper dive into the psychology. The gut brain axis, that is the network of cellular and chemical signaling between the gut and the nervous system associates change in the gut microbiome with behavior and neuromuscular conditioning. So how about things like Parkinson's disease? How about things like anxiety, depression, or even autism? How about it? There's no question about it. This is bad messaging, bad signaling, and bad nutrition. I don't know how many hundreds of families I've worked with who had autistic children just by changing their diet to the Hippocrates lifestyle. There was dramatic and consistent improvement. I don't know how many people have come here for an unrelated problem, but because of that problem, they were often anxious and depressed. And we've seen that go to the wayside. I don't know how many people with Parkinson's disease that were degenerating the whole system halted by changing their lifestyle to the right foods, the foods that all creatures on earth eat except human beings. Continual evidence suggests that select members of the microbiota have the ability to synthesize and or regulate various neurochemicals. Now, that, oh boy, this is really exciting stuff. And this is very recent, by the way. This is in the last six months we've gotten this science. So what we now know is that your brain chemistry literally depends upon the bacterias and particular forms of bacteria, not just bacteria. This is where we're getting to a point of being refined and speak with utter authority on this subject now. And the one that I'm most interested in is serotonin. In the past, I would say it correctly, but we didn't have the depth of data that we have today. I said that that's called happy juice serotonin. Now, serotonin is actually scientifically called 5-HT. And many of you have been told by intelligent nutritional scientists or doctors, by the way, if you have depression, take 5-HTP. It's a form of that. And there's been great results with it. But by the way, you're not supposed to have to take a supplement to reverse depression or prevent depression. You're supposed to be eating and living a particular way. And so why depression and anxiety is rampant today is we're not eating a particular way. Serotonin is functional in a diverse neurotransmission. Neurotransmission happens to be hormones. And remember I showed you that movement from the spine, from the intestinal tract, up the spine to the brain, and from the brain downward, that's neurotransmitters. And serotonin is responsible for supporting this neurotransmitter. This can be elusive sometimes though. Now, serotonin is the most widely distributed transmitter in the brain. 
and the signaling pathways. Now think of that. Think of what it's actually responsible for. Homeostasis, that's actually biological balance, physiological balance. Sensory processing. That means you see something. If you don't have enough serotonin, you can't relate to what it is. And how many of you find yourself stumbling? You've seen that a thousand times, but you can't put two and two together. Cognitive control. So is your mind rampant and running like a wild horse? Or is it under control where you can utilize it as a violin? Emotional regulation. Do you fly off the handle, get really depressed? And you don't have to be bipolar to do that, by the way. And bipolar is actually in part, in great part, created by lack of serotonin. Autotomic response. You know how important that is, especially as we get older, like motor activity? And so why people, as we age, become feeble, fall, lose their memory, we're now leading you right into it. Isn't it interesting how much more simple it is than all the people doing big research with billions of your donated dollars to find out why we have dementia? Why do we have depression? Why do we have Parkinson's? Well, for free here on The Real Truth About Health, you're going to learn. Serotonin production. The majority of the body serotonin is contained within the gut, 90%. So let's go back and revisit the immunity, 80%. And let's talk about serotonin, which controls practically your entire emotional human being, 90%. And if you go to university, they're not going to tell you this. Isn't that interesting? So they're colonized in your microbiome. And this is communities. They're responsible for the production and circulation of the serotonin. Now, you could create serotonin. Let's imagine 90% of your serotonin is being created in your intestinal tract. And by the way, I'm being very conservative because I've read out of the last um, 12 articles I've read, eight of them are now saying it's between 93 and 96%. So almost everything is. 90 is pretty good. So that's a low end of the scale here. Guess can't stay within your intestinal tract. It has to be circulated. Now, remember, we go back to that picture we showed you of coming out of the intestinal tract and going up the neurological system to the human brain. And by the way, after it does its job there, it comes back down and takes care of all of those responses and control mechanisms you have that make your emotional person up. Now, linking the microbiome to the immune system, we'll go back and take a deeper dive. And once again, look at how the bacteria multiply so rapidly. This is literally not in any way speeded up. This is how it works. This is just an electron microscope looking at the bacteria manifesting within the human system. Immune signaling and serotonin. How many of you know you have these things right now listening to me, believe it or not, lighting up? And it has recently been discovered that serotonin provides a link between neuronal signaling and immune response, establishing a well-defined neuroimmune communication network throughout the body. Well, just today, I was reading a study that came out nine months ago that literally tells you they now have linked it to cancer. So if you, by the way, don't have adequate amounts of serotonin because you haven't fed yourself the right diet, and we're going to get to that in a minute, you basically are going to be greatly, greatly capable of contracting a wide variety of cancers. We actually know that it talks to the T cell. Serotonin and its signaling causes the activation of T cells. T cells form the majority of the pillar of the adaptive immune system. Now, last year, if you watched my presentation, I made it really simple for every one of you to understand the immune system. That was the entire presentation. So you can access that on The Real Truth About Health. As a recent serotonin turns on and off our immunity. Can you imagine that? So now this protein communication that Burbell talked about way back 23 years ago 
literally, we went one, one step deeper. This may be five steps deeper. Let's be candid about this. And we actually realize we know it's the T cell, the adaptive immune system. Now, remember, you have two immunities. You have one that anything that comes in that ought not to be there, bad guys. Now, again, what are bad guys? Bad guys are bad bacteria. And the bacterial infections come from that. Bad viruses. Fungi. Mold. The wrong yeast. Parasites. The list goes on. So in the first 96 hours, this part of the immune system basically fights it. And if it's so strong, so strong that it makes it through, it goes to the second layer. They're the elite military soldiers, the immune soldiers that literally beat it up. And by the way, if it doesn't happen after 96 hours and it goes to the secondary immune system, you're in trouble. That's when people end up with fatality out of microbial diseases. Now, I want you to look at this because this is so descript. Now, first, I'll preface it by saying I'm not a big fan of animal studies, although Anna Marie and I went up and spent a week at a genetics conference at the Jackson Laboratory in Maine about five years ago. And we were quite interested because that laboratory creates the premier, the perfect, the contessori animals that they use for this research. And I went as far, if you know my personality, why? to actually interview the man that invented those little mice. And I feel bad for them, but on the other hand, they do use these in research. Now look where it says wild mice. Wild mice means people who are living the way that they did 100, 500, 1,000 years ago. And if you remember, we said 1850 to 2050. And we said America sort of led the way not to live like we did 100, 200, 300, 500 years ago. And other countries are just beginning to, and they haven't fallen yet. And some countries have done it a little less than we have, and they've fallen somewhat. Well, look at here. Here's living proof of. And I say living. Now, many of you out there that really don't know a whole lot about biology are going to say, well, these are mice. They're not human beings. I don't want to let you know this, but genetically, you're very close to a mice. <laughs> and by the way, there's something that's even more funny to me. A fruit fly is like 98% genetically identical to us. So look at the wild mice there. And what I just articulated, I explained to you about the immune system being turned on from serotonin in the T cell response going back and forth with proteins that are the communication device it actually creates an attack on the bad guy coming in. Now the sterilized mice, look what happens. There's no attack. So there's no communication at all. So the end result, one mice runs away and goes to the mice colony again and has fun and lives a long life. And the other mice basically die. I don't know how much more clear we can be on this, and you can always reference every study that I'm seeing. And by the way, out of dozens or 100 studies it took to put this program together, I've only selected a handful. Antibiotics. I said something sort of good about them before. But now we're going to say because they're overused, misused, and prolonged used, we have problems with them. I love the word anti-infectives. That's what they're supposed to be. And boy, when they invented them by mistake, by the way, how many of you remember the story of how they discovered antibiotics? There was a guy messing around with mold on bread. It was probably white bread. <laughs> and by the way, what happened? He said, well, there's something in there when I look at my microscope that seems to be attacking this bacteria that's on my Petri dish. And he was really a bright guy, obviously. And he started to mess with it and he created something we call penicillin. And again, it has saved so many people's lives because bacterial disease was the number one cause of death. Microbial disease was the number one cause of death. And very, very, very few people died of lifestyle diseases. They did, were non-existent. The only people that had lifestyle diseases were the aristocracy. They were the ones who were sick and overweight. And they used to think it was because they were interbreeding. 
Now they realize it was the elite lifestyle they were living that all of us looked up at them and said, oh, when we get a few dollars in our pocket, we want to mimic them. And that's exactly what happened. Remember, 100 years ago, hardly anyone ate meat. Nobody ate processed food. Everything was 100% organic. That's a fact, not an opinion. So antibiotics are different from all other drugs. They not only affect the individual to whom they are given, but also all other life forms they interact with. So if you're hugging and kissing or kissing, uh, loving somebody, by the way, that has taken antibiotic, that's going to be transferred to you. Just like chemotherapy, any legitimate, and I quote legitimate, oncologist is going to tell somebody who's taken radiation or chemotherapy not to get close to or sleep in the bed with somebody for quite a period of time until that wanes and goes down a little bit. So this is something that's so pervasive, used so widely, that we cannot escape this. As clean of a lifestyle that I live, I'm sure when I'm taking a shower in a hotel that doesn't have a filter on the shower, I'm contracting some of this. Because one of the great vehicles of contracting antibiotics, besides taking it directly, is getting it in water, but worse than that is through animals. Antibiotics and disease. Now, there are significant volumes of data now on everything I'm going to talk about. Studies found uh, or done on young people literally show that what we know is that in obesity is increased when they've taken antibiotics. So yeah, eating bad food and fast food make our children chubby. But guess what? The ones who have taken antibiotics are even more chubby and have a much more difficult time maintaining homeostasis or balance. Type 1 and type 2 diabetes. Data is clear. Inflammatory bowel disease. This was something we saw in rare cases with young men in their early 20s. Just last week, I dealt with a nine-year-old with an inflammatory bowel disease because we are so subjecting our children to a devastating disease-causing lifestyle that it's starting to affect the youngest among us at this point. Celiac disease, allergies, wow, that's out of control, and asthma, which I had as a child. No wonder I was brought up on antibiotics and non-foods. Now, this is exactly what happens to your villa that you saw before, you know, the hula dancers that go back and forth, suck the nutrition, or in my old case, drugs, sugar, meat, <laughs> whatever I was taking, and it takes it down there, and then it processes it through there. And as you see, the gut bacteria creates balance, but if you take the antibiotic, it bombs it. It's like putting a nuclear bomb inside of your gut. And as you see at the end there, at the very bottom, it creates inflammation that creates disease. Remember, inflammation is not what creates disease. Inflammation is one of the signaling messages of disease. It is doing things like taking antibiotics and eating non-foods and being stressed that create it. So when a doctor says the holistic types love to spout this out, inflammation creates all disease. Wrong. Bad living, bad lifestyle, taking pharmaceutical drugs create inflammation, which is a symptomology of all disease. Antibiotics in animals raised for food. Can you imagine people are still doing this? It's outrageous to me. I haven't touched an animal-based food for over half a century. Raised four incredibly healthy children, never touched an animal-based food eight grandchildren, and we watch what happens here at the Institute when people are wise enough and strong enough and smart enough, let's be clear, to get off this nonsense. Nearly half of all antibiotics are used for raising animals that some choose to consume. This is the sad part of the story. 87% of antibiotics used in raising these victimized animals are either never or very, very rarely used in human medicine. So now we have another problem. The human body, as I said, becomes adapt to whatever you do to it. That's why some people do horrific things for a long time and they don't immediately die. That the body has a way to unfortunately synthetically protect itself. 
But when you are now introducing a drug that was made for an animal, be it a steer or be it a chicken or be it a fish, yes, fish have higher amounts of antibiotics than the first two I mentioned. Uh, literally, now you're putting a real bad messaging within the intestinal tract that goes into the brain and the neurological system and utter confusion and chaos occurs. And your body starts to have neuronal problems and worse, it could start to mutate into cancer. Gut inflammatory conditions. So the gut inflammatory conditions themselves of our course been intimately linked to the microbiome such as inflammatory bowel disease, celiac, diverticulosis, diverticulosis, lysis. But this is what you begin before Crohn's disease, colitis. These are things that are so unbelievably sad when people have it, which are 100% correctable, by the way. I've never seen anyone who was sincere about getting well, who did this well and long enough, that wasn't able to reverse these things. As with all aspects of the microbiota, these associations are present, not just with bacteria communities, but for all other microbes, such as various ectics and parasites in inflammatory bowel disease or potential via triggers in diabetes. How many of you know that there's a type of diabetes that's completely, absolutely created from taking an antibiotic? And many, many women who are pregnant and they go through the normal system and they're in hospitals and they take antibiotic, they tell them, oh, it's pregnancy that caused it. No, it was the drugs they were taking in the conventional way for pregnancy. Now, uh, we're going to start to see what happens in the world. The weakened immune system of the West. Now, to repeat once again, so you don't forget the point I'm making today. 80% of your immune system comes out of healthy intestinal tract, if you have it. 90% of your psychology, your emotions, come out of your intestinal tract if you have that. So here's what happens. Prevalence of food allergies in preschool children is now at its highest level, at about 10% in the Western countries. It was so rare, I would see when I was a child, in the middle of the 20th century, somebody with an allergy. It was almost an enigma at that point. Look, look at this. But this remains just 2% in areas of mainland China. Now why? Because mainland Chinese people live like they did 100, 200 years ago. If you go happen to go into the big cities that they're westernizing, they're eating fast food, there's big problems. And the next slide is going to talk more about that. The number of new cases of type 1 diabetes in Finland per year is 62.3 per every 100,000. You say, well, that's not many until you see a comparison with just 6.2 in Mexico, 10 times less. And look at Pakistan. They really live like they did 500 years ago. Less than one half of 1% they have. And we all say, oh, we don't want to be around the dirt. Guess what? Seems to be healthy to be around the dirt because a lot of your microbiome comes from the soil. And the cleaner, the more sterile we become. And a, and a, a case point is Japanese people. You notice they were wearing masks before you were mandated to wear a mask. Why? They are so clean, so away from the soil, other than a handful of farmers that are there, that literally they don't interconnect with the very planet, the earth that is part of this system. We are not the elite who rule the world. The microbiome rules us. And we interconnect with all of these biological environments outside of us. Finland was so concerned about this because the problem is not only they have you know, type one diabetes, they have more allergies than other countries. They're sicker. There's more absentee from school than other countries. They did an experiment in Helsinki where they actually brought in soil, organic soil from the forest, and actually made sure the children five days a week for one and a half to two hours played in the soil. And remarkably, within six months, these children 
had about the same exact ratio as Mexican children did. Just interacting with healthy soil. How many of you have to go all of the time? And I don't mean number one, I mean number two. This is colitis, a form of inflammatory bowel syndrome, IBD as we call it. This is on an, an upswing like I've never seen it. It's higher in Western Europe by twofold. That's 100% higher amounts than in Eastern Europe. Now think of what I'm saying to you. Here I am in Eastern Europe. Here I am in Western Europe. I have double the amount of inflammatory bowel syndrome, and inflammatory bowel disease, if I go from this border to that border. Why? Because they live in a very passive and natural way comparatively. Sadly, when we brought the money to us, we began to abuse our lifestyles with the money. Nothing wrong with money. You can use it for the right thing. What's wrong is what we use it for. And we somehow think it's uncivil to live the way our great-grandparents did. Seemingly, it's uncivil to lay, live the way we are living today. And we have the data and facts to show that. The single greatest predictor of a healthy gut, microbiota, is the diversity of plants in one's diet. Diversity and richness of the gut microbiota. The diversity of the microbiome appears to have an important association with the BMI, obesity, and arterial function. Now we introduce to you heart disease. Just about three months ago, one of my favorite research centers in the world, Hebrew University, reported something I've been waiting for for decades. After 50 young years old, 90% of people in the West have periodontal disease. That's an overgrowth of bad guys in the mouth. I'll repeat it. Nine out of 10 people after the ripe young age of 50 have overgrowth of bad guys in the mouth, bad microbes in the mouth. What they did is they looked at four major stage four cancers, liver, pancreatic, bone, and lung. And they took the cancer cells out and actually discovered the DNA of the bad guys from the mouth. Now that doesn't mean it's 100% the cause of the cancer, but what it absolutely without question means, in part, it created those cancers. There's evidence, once again. And when you alter this function, it's outrageous. It's overwhelming research suggests that plant-based diets form a greater diversity of these healthy bacteria within you. A positive association between local microbe richness and long-term fruit and vegetable intake is confirmed. I'll repeat it again. Reference the bottom of what I'm saying here. There's nothing I'm saying I can't show you is in current and valid and incredibly important research today. So we now know that why we have one third less in the West, fancy people doing fancy things, clean as a dog, by the way, is because we're not consuming the plants like all of the primal people do, the more natural living people do around the globe. The first time I saw this was about 10 years ago where they compared the Italians in Europe, who by the way, have the healthiest microbiome, they only have about a 22 to 23% less than Germans would have, or Swedes would have, or Danes would have, or et cetera, French would have, to the Africans, who, by the way, have the healthiest microbiome. Africans, the original people who most often in the tundra, in the deserts, eat the way that their ancestors did a long, long time ago, basically have two forms of bacteria that they don't find anywhere else on the planet Earth. But by the way, the Italians, which are the closest to the Africans, because the Africans migrated, specifically the Ethiopians, and a lot of the Southern Italians have genetic mixture with this, by the way, are the closest, and they're down about one quarter compared to the rest of us that are down to about one third. Raw and plant-based. 
Now, I know you're going to hear a lot about plant-based and cooking's fine and all that. I respect and honor the people who have taken you to that very first step. We're going to take you to where we've been now for seven decades in a research setting, working with the sickest people on the planet Earth. And what's elating me is now, after doing this research to present this to all of you around the world today, I have even a better understanding than I did a few months ago as to why this has been incredibly effective, well beyond a cooked plant-based diet. Whole plant foods have protective effects, favoring the growth of beneficial fiber degradating bacteria in the colon. So how many of you notice when you eat salad, you eat raw food, you get a lot of gas? You don't have the bacteria within your intestinal tract to break it down like the Africans would or like your ancestors would have. Doesn't mean you can't digest it as doctors tell you, no. You can't digest food when it's cooked. There's little to nothing to digest, and the fiber is neutered. Now, let's go back again. 80% of your immune system, 90% of your psychology depends upon healthy bacteria being fed by plants. And once you cook them, the pile of cellulose mush does not provide the enzymatic activity that I showed you in a slide about 22 minutes ago that literally showed you that you need the enzymes to come and break it down, bring the messaging up, the entire neuron system to the brain and back down from the brain to the body to make the body and the brain function the way it was meant to because every single creature on earth except humans in nature consume 100% raw diet. We're the only species that cook our food. And our founder after healing stage four cancer Back in 1950s, early 1950s, got it. Not because she was a great intellectual, because she was a great instinctualist who saved her life by doing what she saw as a peasant girl in Eastern Europe. When people got sick, they ate raw plants, they ate raw herbs, they ate raw food. And how did they learn that? Not because they went to some intellectual, because they saw animals do it. You saw your dog do it. You saw your cat do it. But we're so arrogant, we don't do what dogs and cats do. That's why we're the sickest species on earth, and we're dying at a rate that has never been paralleled in the history of the human race. One step more, there's a larger species kill-off today than there ever has been in the history of the planet Earth, because we don't honor the mother that we choose to live on. We don't respect the biology, that's a gift. It's a temporary gift, as Chief Seattle said. Respect the earth. We temporarily have it, so we pass it down to our children and their children. What do we do? We destroy it. We rape it. We pull the blood out of it. And then we wonder why we're sick. And humanity's close to demise. Shame on us. And if you're really serious about being healthy and can take the little bit of gas and pain and suffering it does in the early days when you consume an organic, raw, plant-based diet, you're now going to feel a level of health that never, ever has come your way before. Polyphenols is one of the magic elements that you find in plant-based foods that, by the way, are completely neutered and gone when you cook the food. Our plant metabolites, you know what that means? You metabolize things. Well, plants do too. And remember photosynthesis? Well, that's a metabolism process. And increase the bifobacteria within your body and the lactobacteria within your body, which provide antipathogenic. What are pathogens? Cancer. Bad guys are that. So now we know that elements that are in plants that were here hundreds and hundreds of millions of years before humans showed up, we're just sort of the new guys on the block here, literally were programmed to heal diseases that didn't even exist. Some of them 100 years ago. Well, think about that for a minute. And anti-inflammatory effects, as well as cardiovascular protection. Wow. Now, I know all the 
Alternative heart docs are all geared up and correct in saying, don't eat eggs, don't eat fish. I'll talk about this in detail and give you real science on it next week on Saturday at one o'clock. Uh, and I honor and respect what they're saying, but if you really want the medicinal protection, the plant-based protection that they promise you, but can't deliver because it's cooked food, you better start considering eating a lot more raw food. Another thing that's really important are nuts and seeds. The more we look at nuts and seeds, by the way, the more exciting these become. So you have a bifobacteria that comes from nuts and seeds. And remember, the, the two nuts you want to avoid because they're not really that healthy for your cashews, which in great part are cooked in the extraction process, even if they're called raw uh, afterward, and peanuts. And watch out here in North America, in the United States specifically, because your government started to realize that uh, there was something magical in, in almonds. And way back 100 years ago, a guy called Edgar Casey told us this. He said, eat five almonds a day if you want to prevent and help to reverse cancer. And that's called abscisic acid. You know it on the street as laetrile. And so as soon as the government started to realize that this was an upswing, people were eating a lot more almonds, they made sure they were irradiated. So you're going to have to have found inventive ways, as we do here at Hippocrates, to find raw almonds. So the healthy diet will include these seeds, sesame seeds, things like you know, flax seeds, things like poppy seeds, things like chia seeds. And when you sprout them, when you germinate them, they're digestible. Any of those seeds I just mentioned, your body can't break them down. So that process of where the enzyme comes and it takes and breaks down the shell, you're going to help it by sprouting. All those little seeds only take soaking for about six hours and germinating, spread them out on a paper towel, spray them with a sprayer from the, from the dollar store with good water twice a day. And in two days, you're going to have little tails on them. And now they become about 18 to 22 times more digestible, and they have about eight times more nutrients, and the fats become essential fatty acids. So these are polyunsaturates that are, you're going to find in there. And you find a lot in walnuts. You know, we always go to walnuts, walnuts, but, you know, pistachios that are raw habit, pecans. I've just recently started to eat pecans for the first time in decades. Incredibly good for you. Macadamia, raw macadamia nuts. And there's so many varieties of pine nuts. Boy, are they great for you. And all of these actually help that bacteria count in the intestinal tract. Now, unlike uh, a salad or a lettuce or a green that comes into the body, gives that cellulose life form, the enzymatically rich, water-rich life form, it comes in and comes out rapidly, where the nuts and the seeds, germinated ones that are becoming plants again, literally stay there much longer and provide a fertile soy, soil for that healthy bacteria to grow in. Enterotypes are stable clusters of bacteria communities that coexist together. So there are three kinds. Prevotella, now these are families, bacterioids and rumococcus. Now every single one of these have to be fed plants and have to be fed raw plants to create the numbers and the strength and the quality required to strengthen and build your immune system, to create your immune system, and to create healthy emotional and psychological order. Isn't that interesting? I'll repeat it again. Maybe you missed the whole point of this presentation. So these three forms of family bacteria all require, not because we think so, because we know so, raw plant-based food to make sure there's enough numbers of these healthy bacteria, and the polyphenols kill off the bad guys, the pathogens. Remember that? Once you cook the plant, the polyphenols aren't there. Once you cook the plant, the cellulose is a big gathering of mush, as you see. What's a spinach look like raw? Spinach look like cooked, not going to feed and create the numbers of healthy immune system cells and the numbers of serotonin receptor sites, neurotransmitters 
that you require, all of us require, right now listening to me, you're using for stability of emotional and psycho psychology. Wow, this is exciting stuff, man. I love this because it's too bad more people don't know this. And it's too bad the powers that be don't care. And it's too bad that this is so profound. You can do this with plants. You don't require anything other than a healthy diet. Maybe that's why it's difficult to find this information. That's why the real truth about health is essential. It's not optional anymore. It's essential. Raw and plant-based. We tell a genus of the bacteria, phyla, appears to be significantly richer in response to a vegan diet. Isn't that interesting? <laughs> So, I mean, the reality is, I mean, I, I don't know what to say. I just really don't know. I just, I just wish people would do more research before they had opinions. Raw versus cooked. Fluid, enzymes, phytochemicals. We haven't even touched on them today. I write books for doctors on that. Any of you doctors listening that really want to have a deep dive into what I'm talking about? I wrote a series of academic books for all of we eggheads. It's called Food is Medicine. And it really describes what we've learned here since the 1950s, employing in a clinical setting on hundreds of thousands of people, a raw organic plant-based diet. And cellulose are the fuel for healthy intestinal flora and fauna, bacteria that means. When molecularly destroying plants by heating, the symphony of propagators are diminished to a pile of lifeless fiber. Bingo, end of story, amen. Now we go over to Povatello and we look at the Chinese versus the Indians. Well, the Chinese eat a lot more meat than the Indians do. Now, I'm not saying the Indian diet's a perfect diet and they cook almost anything, but they tend to eat a lot more raw and a whole lot more vegetables per capita than do the Chinese people. So look at how much more the Indians have versus the Chinese. The Indians have in their intestinal tract a little over 13, and the Indians have less than 1%. And by the way, most likely, in the past at least, if not now, those of you listening don't eat a healthy diet like the Chinese do. You eat something worse than the Chinese diet. So the fact of the matter is, I can't even imagine what a Western intestinal tract is if the Chinese who eat a lot more plants than we do, even though they're processed and cooked, have less than 1%. Ruminococcus, this is associated with long-term vegetable consumption. Species of this gen genus are specialized in degradating complex carbohydrates such as cellulose and resistant starches found in plant-based foods. So guess what? I'll bet a million dollars when you woke up one day and said, I'm so sick, I'm frightened, I better become a plant-based eater. Or you woke up and said, I don't wanna get sick and I wanna live a long life, I'm gonna become a plant-based eater. Your body didn't have enough of this in it. <laughs> but guess what? I'm telling you right now, we know this to be a fact, that if you consume a raw plant-based diet, in the worst case scenario, Within a matter of 90 days, you will have the right amount, providing you're not drinking alcohol, taking pharmaceutical drugs, first and foremost, antibiotics, and chemo and radiation. You will have this, not in nine years, but in 90 days. And that's the worst case scenario. Uh, when testing people, which we do with a bacterial laboratory, it happens as little as three weeks. This is positively associated with low BMI, aha, uh -huh, gastrointestinal problems, and associated with poor lipid profiles. This is how science talks. I'll inverse it. <laughs> what it really means is, by the way, you don't have a lot of cholesterol if you eat this food, because this particular form of bacteria literally help to eat up fats, bad lipids, cholesterols in your body. Now, you need cholesterol. I'm not saying you don't need cholesterol but it keeps it at a balanced level. Gut restoration with a plant-based diet. In consuming a modern Western diet, it is like weakening a muscle. 
Just think of that. You sit around, you don't use your muscle. What's it going to look like? What's your arm? What's your leg going to look like? Pretty bad shape. In this case, the muscle is critical for the absorption of nutrients and the protection of your overall health. By incrementally, slowly but surely, incorporating a range of plant-based foods, you are able to strengthen your gut's ability to digest and absorb nutrients through a healthy and functional microbiome. Boy, simple, profound, powerful, and what I'll say is effective. Understanding fermentation. We've all heard this, we've read it, you've probably listened during some of the conferences here that people who live a long time always are taking higher amounts of good bacteria. Well, historically, we didn't have supplements like we do today. We actually took ferment, we fermented food. I mean, if you look at the Europeans, it's sauerkraut. If you look at the Asians, it's kimchi. And this is something that is in every single culture, dietary culture in the world. The first guy that talked about it, interesting enough, was Louis, Louis Pastor. <laughs> and old Louis was a really smart guy. On his deathbed, he said, hey, you guys ran with what I said. I didn't say that all diseases were microbial, but they didn't ever write that in the books because the farms like you to think it's microbial because they have one resolution for every disease, bomb it and kill it without considering you, the host, they're bombing and killing. But that's another story for another day. Passover proved that the microorganisms play an essential role in fermentation. So he was the first guy that said these little bacteria, and they didn't know much about bacteria then, that are eating up the cellulose. Aha! Now, was the cellulose feeding it, or was it eating the cellulose? I'm going to have you think about that for a minute. I think it was a combination. It was back and forth of this. This is, in addition, he found the unwanted production of some substances, such as lactic acid, went away. Imagine that. We want to take away the bad guys, you ferment the food. You want to take away the bad guys. I know that we're now talking about Dr. Gumbridge and Gumbry and how he's talking about lectins and all of this stuff. All you have to do is sprout a food. They go away. So the bad guys, the enzyme inhibitors that really are not bad guys, they're what nature put in to plant seeds millions and millions of years ago to protect the plant seed, by the way, so that the animal wouldn't eat the last of that type and the bug wouldn't eat the last of that type. The germination process naturally and gracefully take that away. So the fermentation process takes away the acids that are aggravating and help to create inflammation. Isn't that beautiful? So what this shows us through a beautiful representation is that fermentation and sprouting actually assist the body to get rid of the bad guys and only get the good guys that actually boost the immune system and give you a basis for good thinking and psychology. Prebiotics fill plant-based foods. I am just so sad that many of you have spent hard-earned money on buying prebiotics. All a prebiotic is is a plant. Now, this one fact alone is something I want you to repeat to every single person that doubts that you're doing the right thing on a plant-based diet. What feeds the healthy bacteria in your intestine is a prebiotic. We've been mentioning it now eight, nine times during this presentation, the cellulose. You are actually paying somebody rather than eating salads, rather than eating plant-based foods for a prebiotic. And by the, one, by the way, even if they don't cook them, if they just grind them up and powder them, they're nowhere, nowhere as close, as effective as would be the raw salad and the plant-based food. So the very essence of the prebiotic are their fertilizing-like quality. Made of plant fiber, that forces and maintains a diverse microbiome. Eating a diverse range of raw plant-based foods allows you to build and maintain a diverse microbiota and not ever 
worry about having disease, and let me now add premature aging. What we know is that every single person that's a centenarian and beyond, when they test their intestinal tract, they are harmonious. They are effective. This is why the longest living people, the longest living tribes, in great part, almost always eat plant-based diets or high plant-based diets. Basic food combining. Now, this is something that is poo-pooed by a lot of the intellectuals out there who think they know better. Now, after everything I've said, let's hope you open up your minds a little bit. If you watch the way that every single creature on earth, herbivorous, frugivorous creature eats, they eat monolithically. That means one food or one type of family of food at a time. We're the only species that eat a large amount of different things. And that's not called diversity, that's called ignorance. And the ignorance comes quite simply because you were taught incorrectly, even by vegan nutritionists and vegan doctors, that by the way, it didn't matter what you eat, it all comes together because they look at the anatomical breakdown of how food goes from the digestive tract into the small intestine and the bowel, and they say, well, it doesn't matter what you eat. Well, it does matter what you eat, because through evolutionary process, your body was built to eat particular families or types of food in very simple ways. This is something I've been following now for the last 45 years with incredible results. I've placed God knows how many endless hundreds of thousands of people on this, and they have great results. So here's the basics on this thing. Protein takes a healthy person about four hours to digest. Now, remember, the Hippocrates living food diet is the highest protein diet on the planet Earth. Nothing comes close to this. So why the actors and actresses and top athletes have gravitated here and employ this program and are the top of their field is because it not only gives you the most nutrition and the most medicine in the form of these phytochemicals we discussed, but it also, by the way, makes it easy for your body's immune system and your psychology to function. So the kind of things, and these are only a handful of examples, pumpkin, sesame, sesame, that little tiny seed is a complete protein. Sunflower, we take it way big steps further. Sunflower, we take it and germinate it and eat the green of it. That makes it actually 23 times more nutritious and digestible than if I didn't sprout it. Nuts like almonds, Brazil nuts, tremendous, pecans, pine nuts, walnuts, and the list goes on and on. These are the proteins. They take about four hours. Now, by the way, you don't want to eat anything after you've eaten a protein for about three hours. You don't want to mix that in the digestive canal together because you're going to slow down this process that literally enhance psychology and biology. And by the way, how many of you remember when you've eaten a whole lot of things together, even raw food together, you get a headache, you feel nauseous. No. Why? I'm telling you right now, they weren't meant to be together and the signaling goes bad. Now, these are much better signaling than the drugs and the antibiotics you took, but the fact is you're still getting signaling. You can't stop, you can't shut down the signal. So the basic food combining starches, Take three hours, so you don't eat anything or drink anything for about two hours. It's gone through basic digestion with starches, things like sprouted grains like amaranth and barley and millet and quinoa and teff and rye and all of these wonderful hard winter wheat. And of course, we're the guys who brought wheatgrass to the world, and wheatgrass is among that. But these are things that are amazingly important, and I'm so sad to see people with high animal protein diets and ketogenic diets and all of this stuff. It's, it's so sad because the energy you get are from these type of complex carbohydrates. That's what your body's built to do, but they have got to be sprouted into plants because the anthropologists today tell us we were not hunters and gatherers. We were gatherers. Small tribes became hunters because they found themselves in a precarious position living in the middle of a winter and there was nothing to eat and they were starving they became animal consumers and the milk out of the bosoms of other species. It's perverted. We'll speak about that more next week in our program together. But when you take these seeds, nuts, grains, and beans, which our great ancestors hardly ever ate, they only ate it during droughts. Because 
People like Dr. Leakey, the anthropologist, actually has done incredible photographic exposés on the teeth of our ancestors leading right up to modern Homo sapiens. And what they, they found is that we were eating plants, fruits and vegetables, greens. And the only time we ate these seeds, nuts, grains, and beans, they were not germinated, was when, by the way, there were droughts and the plant wasn't there to eat. The crop wasn't there to harvest. So the fact of the matter is, to make it the way your ancestors ate and the way your body was evolutionarily programmed to consume nutrients and food is you germinate these things. Easy to do. Takes you a matter of a minute and a half to two minutes, period. In two, three days, they'll be done. Basic food combining groups for easier digestion, the microbiome diversity. Vegetables take about two and a half hours at the very most. That means about two hours, then 50 minutes, 30 minutes after, you can start eating something else or drinking something else. So that's a wide variety of light leafy greens. One of my favorite vegetables, I eat a lot of it every day, we grow it here on our campus at our organic garden, is arugula. Arugula is like eight times more calcium than the, this next best thing. <laughs> you never saw so much, but things like radish and the greens of radish, the sprouts, we call them microgreens today. You know, We sort of brought these to the world, but now they've changed the name of it. They used to be called sprouts, uh, but the fact of the matter, microgreens, these are tremendous foods. By the way, far, 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 far more nutrition than vegetables that were harvested weeks ago that you buy at your organic store. You're actually having these things grow in your home just as you eat them and harvest them or take them out and harvest them from the bottle you're growing a sprout in. I mean, these are really the foods by far with the most medicine in it, by far with the most nutrition in it, by far with the most health-giving properties in it. I mean, we see psychological shifts here. Of course, we have psychotherapists everyone see. We have a medical team that shocking in every single group, every single person, even if they don't have an emotional problem, everyone improves their emotions. And then you have fruits. The average digestion time is... 30 minutes to one hour, you know, the more condensed fruits like banana would take longer, the watery fruits would take less. So we don't want to eat anything after that. Melons are the quickest by far, 15, 20 minutes, they rush through the body. That's why we're all standing in a queue at the restroom when we take melons. Uh, but the fact is, you don't want to be mixing all of these things together. Even the fruits go at different speeds through the body. Carbohydrates go. So you wouldn't eat a melon with a banana, as an example, or with an apple. You would eat them separately. And let me preface this. Here at the Institute, we've learned over the years because of the hybridization of fruit and the extraordinary sugar content comparative to the ancestral fruits, only healthy people should eat small amounts of this. When people are ill, we take them off all forms of sugar, including fruit. So here's what I am saying to you today. Greater amounts of plant-based diversity, you have a stronger and healthier microbiota. Stronger and healthier you. End of story. Thank you so, so much, Brian. Um, so thorough as always, and we really, really appreciate that. Um, ready for some Q&A? Ready? Take it away. So appreciate that. In fact, before we jump into that, um, I just want to make sure everybody knows where to get your books. Where's the best place to get your books or reach back out to you directly? I'm sure that Amazon has it, you know, but I'm, I'm not a big supporter of Amazon. They're selling like 70% of the supplements now. You know, they're taking over the world. It's a monopoly. So you can call a Hippocrates store, get on the Hippocrates website, Hippocrates Institute, H-I-P-P. O-C-R-A-T-E-S, healthinstitute.org. We're a nonprofit organization. There's a few you have up there. Uh, as you were mentioning before, the most popular, I can tell people how to walk on water and heal disease, but they were more interested in sex. <laughs> but the, you know, my, I have a book I'm writing right now with a physician, How to Live to 120. And we're really excited about it because we're taking a different pathway. That should be out later this year, early next year. Uh, a book is coming out in the next two weeks, uh, Discovering You and You. It's really an extraordinary way to see 
uh, not the biology, but the psychology and the diet and how it affects you in emotional and spiritual ways and how intercommunication with other people do. Uh, another book I've done on weight loss, we're awaiting a publisher to publish that extremely soon from what we understand. And my favorite book I've ever written, because it's the only one that's taken nine years to write, the year that we all got together and created the real truth about health. I started a book called Quantum Human Biology. And this is really the state of the state of the state of the art of modern medicine, taking us well beyond what we're even talking about today and to the future of medicine, electromagnetic energy frequency. This is what we have here at the Institute. By the way, we're the only institute like this in the world that have an energy medicine department. And it's a big, big, big part of healing. It's just great because you're made of energy. And all of these things I'm talking about you notice one time I said it in this presentation, all of this food breaks to energy. And if you don't have the proper energy going up the proper channels, that energy can backfire on you, create disorder. Can I make a request for your next book? Sure you can. The next book is. Yeah. So the next book is tell everybody how you got 45 hours a day and we all only have 24 hours a day. How, <laughs> how do you do all of this? I, well, I well, let, let me just say this to you. You know, I was a fat American. I was smoking a lot of cigarettes, three packs a day. I was stoned constantly. Thank God all I got on is, is grass, but I was constantly stoned. I, I played in rock bands when I was a kid. I played in jazz trios when I was a kid. And so where I was is in nightclubs that were, I mean, I could even see the guitar player and the piano player and the bass player. That's how much smoke were in these clubs. So that's where I came from. And I had a rude awakening when I found myself obese, and I found a wonderful woman. I mean, this woman who was in her 70s who told me I had to change and I had to get on a, a, a vegetable diet. You know, to me, this was so far, and it was like saying I have to walk on the moon. You know, I had no concept of what it was. But one thing I, I learned as a child from loving parents is when somebody is trying to help you to have some gratitude. So even though I didn't trust or believe her at the beginning, I had gratitude, and she made me trust and believe her, and she converted me in 1970 to a plant-based eater. And I never looked back, and Lillian, who's now gone, uh, every day I think of Lillian, and all of us need that. We have maybe this program and others here, this seven-day period, 17-day period on The Real Truth will influence you. But listen, open your heart, open your mind. We're not here to sell you something. We're here to help humanity evolve. We're here to help humanity save itself at this moment. And I know so many of us are filled with gratitude for that. So thank you. And, and with that, let's jump into our, our uh, Q&A questions. Um, again, folks, you've got a great opportunity here to have an intimate session with Brian Clement. And uh, Brian, I want to make sure that everybody knows how we go about this here at The Real Truth About Health. I can see some raised hands already, which is terrific. And for those of you that don't know, uh, the way we take questions here at The Real Truth About Health, we don't normally take them directly from the chat box, but we ask you to look at all of your Zoom tab controls. One of those tabs on your Zoom, on your Zoom window is called your Reactions tab. You click on your Reactions tab, and once you do that, a whole bunch of different emojis pop up and one of them is your raised hand function. You click on that, we will see the raised hands come in. We have a lot of questions coming in. We'll get to as many as we possibly can, folks. I'm gonna ask everybody to keep their short and brief, keep their question short and brief and to the point and uh, so we can get to as many as we possibly can. Brian, if you're set. Ready to go. All right, thank you. So I'm going to bring now in David R. And hi, David, welcome. Hi, thank you so much for your presentation. Uh, I have two quick questions. You mentioned uh, uh, sprouting. Uh, my first question, can you sprout uh, nuts that come in pieces? For example, walnuts usually come in pieces and not a whole. And my second question regarding the food combination that you mentioned, is it every group needs to be eaten by itself or you can combine, for example, salad with legumes and grains? Or you, you would recommend to eat the salad alone, wait two hours, and then eat the grain, and then uh, wait, and then eat the legume, etc. Well, Sart, you. that's an excellent question, and I neglected to articulate that broad enough. So vegetables and sprouts go with either proteins or carbs. So in either case, you basically can eat salads and greens and sprouts and microgreens with them. 
In fact, the only thing you have to consider is when am I going to eat a protein meal and when am I going to eat a starchy carbohydrate meal? Now, if you really think about it, you want to eat your protein meal in the middle of the day. So your nuts, your seeds, your nut loaf, your nut burger, your sauces, uh, et cetera. Because now you have four hours to digest it. If you're like me, many times I'll be eating at 7.30 at night and I'm going to bed at 9.30. You don't want to have food from protein that's not digested. So ideally, protein meals in the middle of the day, starchy carbs that only take a couple of hours to digest, better in the evening. So excellent question. Now, the first one is, is germinating, sprouting. You know, this is the natural occurring process that all plants go through. So you buy organic seeds, no matter what a seed is, it all sprouts if it's live. If they haven't cooked it, they haven't radiated, they haven't processed, every single seed, nut, grain, and bean can be sprouted. And if you can't sprout them, you shouldn't eat them. That means they're dead. So a lot of light leafy green sprouts, like alfalfa, clover, uh, onions, radish, you can stick in a jar, put some water in, let it soak for six, eight hours, put a screen on the top with a rubber band, take the water that was soaking on your house plant or on a tree outside. They love it because the enzyme inhibitors are there. You know, Gundry is talking about how bad that is. Well, that's not bad. It's protecting the plant. Basically, you put that out. They love it. And by the way, you then rinse them once or twice a day, humid climates twice a day, uh, non-humid climates once a day. And in about five, six days, that whole jar is filled with the most edible medicinal plants that you can imagine you can grow in the middle of a snowstorm in the winter in Alaska. <laughs> so that's it. Now, other ones like sunflower greens or the microgreens, you take the seeds, soak them in the same way. Uh, you then put them on soil. You can buy serving trays and put them there. And they grow in five, six, eight days. And now you have these incredible powerhouses of nutrition you can survive on. You can live on these things. And then other ones take, you know, uh, lentils take three days. But lentils are the highest iron source on the planet Earth. So when people have low iron counts, because generally they've been lacking B12, not because they're vegans, because they're eating the way the Americans do and Western people do. Basically, they start taking that and we see a major difference. Of course, we give them supplemental B12 too to make sure they don't have a reoccurrence of that. So excellent two questions. Thanks very much for that, uh, Brian. And let's now go to Lorraine. Welcome, Lorraine. Hi. Oh, you are a wealth of information. Thank you so much. Um, I'm 81 years old. I have eaten ice cream most of my life. Needless like to me. say, <laughs> my uh, LDL was uh, uh, 288 four months ago. I'm going to be tested next month. I've lost 30 pounds. I'm on strict whole food plant-based diet, no exceptions. However, my question to you is, how much fat should I allow into my diet? I have been very diligent, uh, like one tablespoon of flax, one tablespoon of chia, no avocados, no other nuts. What would you suggest? No oils, uh, no salt, no sugar. Um, okay. Well, I am a, so proud after a lifetime of eating junk well, and you know, um, okay. I'm looking good. <laughs> well, let, let me tell you, love, I'm, I'm just so happy when people are transparent and candid like that. That was my biggest fix. I always said it was one stop shopping. I got sugar and I got fat and I ate a lot of it. I mean, that was the hardest thing for me to give up. Even though I liked meat when I gave it up 52 years ago, I liked ice cream a lot more. <laughs> <laughs> and I, at the beginning, by the way, the farm made the very first vegan ice cream out of soy, which wasn't that great. But I remember I got hooked on that for a period of time. Don't get hooked on it. You don't need any of it. So you are absolutely correct, especially as we're aging and forget just as we're aging throughout your life, you need essential fatty acids. And by taking sprouted flax seeds, taking chia seeds that are sprouted. And you can either sprout these yourself, you can buy them sprouted and then redried. And for instance, uh, today before I came to speak to all of you around the world, I ate a salad that was, had about 21 different greens in it, of which seven of them were sprouts. Arugula was in there, I mentioned. And by the way, I put six different seeds on that. That's what I do with my salad every single day. I have all the essential fats so that my memory does not go bad. 
If you look at long-term people in this field, not the newbies who've been around 20, 30 years, but people like Hippocrates, Dr. Furman, who grew up eating this way, we all know that one of the problems that we have is a lot of people don't take any essential fats. And when you don't take essential fats, your brain starts to go south. And I'm going to tell you, that's not a good thing for you. Thanks very much for that, Brian. And uh, up next, we have Gail. Welcome, Gail. Hi. Thanks so much, Brian. Um, I just was wondering if you could clarify um, about sprouting beans. Um, I asked a question of your wife the other day, but I just wanted to be clear that you, if you sprout any kind of bean, you don't have to cook it at all. Is that no, 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 that not at all. I mean, I know there's some debate about kidney beans because a lot of our intellectual friends get, you know, intellectual, <laughs> but I've never found a, a sprouted kidney bean, but avoid that for the sake of that discussion. But there's no other bean. I mean, I'm not a big fan of soybeans because they're a little difficult to digest even when they're germinated, but every other bean's amazing for you. I mean, chickpeas are a bean and we call them a, a pea. They're 25% they're protein. Red meat, if you were silly enough to eat it and slaughter the animal and drink the blood out of its neck is only 19% protein. When you cook it, it's not a complete protein. <laughs> so you buy, that's how important these things are. Now, when I began all of this, uh, Diet for a Small Planet was the big biblical book at that point. And back then, we didn't know it nearly what we should have known. And we used to tell people, you have to take beans and rice together and they, to get the... I'm going to tell you, I could sit here for the next two hours and give you one type of food that has complete protein in it and not stop for two hours. You know, we just said the little lowly sesame seed. Why, why in the Middle East, they say open sesame. When I was over there many, many decades ago, I said, why? They said that saved our life. They didn't know it was a protein. They didn't know it was a calcium then. Now, again, it wasn't long-term survival, but the fact was they weren't dying of protein starvation. So a lot of foods have complete proteins in them. And beans are great, but you don't need them so much for that. You need them for that roughage. Remember I said, when you take a sprouted bean, you take a sprouted nut, you take a sprouted seed, they stay within the intestinal tract with that fibrous cellulose, with those phytochemicals, with the phenols, and all of the, the things that are going to be medicinal for your body, and actually give incredible messaging to the brain and to the immune system. You want them to be in there for longer than a salad would be. You need salad for different reasons. Salad comes in and stimulates and basically gets circulation and brings more hydration into the body and actually brings more hormones in. There's more hormones in fresh, raw, sprouted greens than there are anything else. And when you put more hormones in, the language becomes much clearer for every cell in the human body. Thank you for that, Brian. And now we're going to go to Benny. Welcome, Benny. Uh, Brian, even if we eat healthy, should we take supplements? And what do you recommend on that? I take a lot of supplements because I'm having fun. Now, I also do a highly sophisticated test here for the guests. I take it once a year. And I haven't had a real deficiency of any type, Anna Marie or I, or obviously our children, uh, in decades. But I still take a lot of supplements. You don't have to wait till you're deficient. You know, this is the, the unfortunate mentality we have in our culture today. When something goes wrong, then we act. Let's act before something goes wrong. So when I start my day sometimes at four in the morning, and I was asked, how do I do all of this? This in part is why I eat this way. I exercise consistently. I lift weight. I do aerobic exercise. I stretch. I have a loving relationship with my wife. I love what I do. This doesn't even work for me. But most important, I fuel myself nutritionally, not only with this powerhouse food, the superior food, but superior supplementation, raw, uncooked, plant-based supplements. I wrote the book on this. Read it. Supplements Exposed. It wasn't popular in health stores, <laughs> but the reality is when you take the right supplements, it's going to give you that edge. It's going to give you, so if I'm working till 10 o'clock lecturing somewhere, I'm not going to be off. I'm going to be on my A game at 10 o'clock at night, even though I woke up at six o'clock that morning and I've been working all day long. Because if you love life, if you're fueled, if your psychology is being actually regulated by these things we talked about today, you are optimistic, you're happy, and you're energized. 
Thank you very much. Folks, when he says he wrote the book, he wrote the book on it. Yes. Thank you very much. Up next, we have Gary. Gary, right ahead. go right ahead. Hi, Gary. Hi, Gary. This is Gary and Denise, actually, from Connecticut. I just have a question on the underestimated choline and its importance on the vegan diet, as well as um, the dosage for their toddler. Well, you have to understand, if you're giving your child the original life form, the algaes, it is riddled with choline. Now, the, one of the safest things, especially if economics are a concern to any of them listening out there today, if you take no other supplement, there's two that you should consider. A living food form of bacterial B12, like the life give form we create. That's actually, if you took a microscope, it's doing this. When you look at it, it's alive. Other ones are dead and chemicalized and not really working. And the second one is algae. If you only took one algae, it's blue-green algae, the original life form that created life. That has choline in it. Now, I choose to take five of those a day. Now, remember, I buy these things wholesale too. So I take blue-green algae. I take chlorella, which is green algae. I take phytoplankton, which is growing in, in Holland. The Dutch government funded a 9 billion euro plant. It's so amazing. I take sea algae in a liquid form, and I take a product that we create called super greens. It has algae and other greens in it. Now, why I do that is that these are so much better than multiple vitamins, it's not even worth talking about. Even the good multiple vitamins, they're fractionally as good as this. The other thing I can say with plants, as much as I'm a doctor of nutrition and I've studied this my whole life and it sounds impressive, we're still learning. We haven't learned everything that's in a plant. And the fact of the matter is, if I'm taking a whole plant supplement or a whole plant-based diet, it may take us 100 years more. I may be gone before we find out there's this and that in it that's actually more important than what we thought was in it. But when you mess with things, you isolate things, you play with things, or you do what those doctors did, oh, if you're a vegan, you don't get choline. If you take the right vegan foods, you get choline. By the way, plant-based raw vegans have the least B12 deficiency of any of us. That's the work of Dr. Fontaine at Washington University in St. Louis. You know, he was stunned to find out vegans still have a problem, not as bad as meat eaters, though. I'm on my 35th year this year of studying B12 deficiencies. And I can tell you something. The ones who have the most are meat, dairy, fish eaters, chicken eaters. They have about an 8% higher than cooked vegans because cooked vegans at least get some cellulose activity to get that probiotic going. Remember, B12 is not a B vitamin. It's a probiotic. It's a soil-based microorganism. Now go back to what I said during this presentation. Why do the Mexicans have 10% of the problem that the Finnish, sterile Finnish people have? Why do the Pakistanis have one quarter of the problems the Mexicans have? They're close to the soil. They're getting the microorganisms. They're getting the bacteria. They're eating food with that in it. You and I think everything has to be sterilized. And that's why we have a sterile brain and a sterile body, and we're sick as a dog today. Thanks very much, Brian. And up next, we're going to bring in Kurt. Kurt, welcome. Oh, Brian, have you had any uh, or, or discuss any possible success you've had in dealing with ankylosing spondylitis? Oh, sure. You know, we're not only at a nutritional institute. You know, this is a, a place that we're comprehensive. That's why people come here from all over the world. We have people here from eight countries as we sit today and speak. That's the campus behind us. And the reality is we have state-of-the-art NUCA doctors, state-of-the-art structural doctors, state-of-the-art medical doctors, electromagnetic energy, coal laser energy. So the spondylosis is not going to get, get well alone with just a good diet. Anyone that tells you that is not telling you the truth or inexperienced, let's put it that way. So you need a combination of building up the nutritional factor and the fascia, the tissue. And we have a physical therapist that helps to do that here and a woman who's a genius with stretching. She used to work with the NFL football teams. And you know, when you start to do that and you allow the muscular structure and the fascia, the tissue to go back to normality, we get circulatory blood flow through and we start to get some of these nutrient factors in. And then we do structural work on you, not jolting the back or doing things that can happen and can hurt you sometimes, by the way. You see remarkable things. I mean, uh, the center my wife directed, Anna Maria in Sweden, 
uh, even though it was greatly nutrition, they were actually showing results. At that center in Stockholm, they actually had the government come in and spend two and a half million dollars uh, back 40 years ago in doing research. And this was one of the disorders they actually said it helped because when you get into that positioning, you get an inflammatory problem. And just by diet alone, the inflammation goes down, allowing a relaxation in the structural problem and a slowdown of the degradation. Let's remember this, that every single animal product in the world, I don't care if it's organic kefir, I don't care if it's organic yogurt, it has three acids in it. And those acids eat away at tissue. They degradate the tissue and bone is tissue. If you see a meat eater, by the way, they have pits in their bones. Why in the countries that have arthritis do they have arthritis? Look at their diets. You know, it's not that it's damp in those countries, <laughs> it's that they have these erosive acids within the animal-based foods. And by the way, uh, some of the unripened fruits that you eat have erosive effects too, just not as aggressive as animal food consumption. So you've got a lot of things to think about, but we've worked with God knows how many hundreds of people with this, with great success, if you follow through. You know, this is not the typical healthcare system, be it allopathic or be it holistic. The difference here is we tell you that we'll help you, we'll support you, we'll treat you, but by the way, you do it. We can't heal you. One thing I have never done with any guests since 1975 when I joined the team here and 1980 when I became director, I've never gone home with a guest and done this for them. And I don't plan on doing it. It's a full-time job doing it myself. So if you're ready and willing to come here and do what we say, Come along. We invite you. <laughs> Brian, thanks very much. We are uh, coming to a close very soon, but I'm going to go to Stacy real quick. Stacy, if you can give us your question. Hi there. Thank you so much for your work. Um, I have a friend who has stage four BRAF metastatic melanoma. Um, would you suggest absolutely no fruit? Absolutely. We, we took fruit over 40 years ago out of the diet of anyone anyone that has cancer. And after we did that, immediately we saw success. And by the way, today, the greatest doctors, some of them have been on The Real Truth About Health, will concur with me. These are the top premier research scientists in the history of cancer. They agree with us. And I can tell you something, anyone that would fight you on that one, uh, it's a disservice to the human race and it's a disservice to healthcare because we have seen the results in four decades here. Uh, thank you very much for that, Brian. Um, we are coming to a close. It's time for our next lecture. I want to say, everyone, thanks for raising your hands. I'm sorry we can't get to every question right now. Um, Brian will be back next week, and hopefully you can get some more questions in then as well. Brian, again, uh, our heartfelt gratitude to you for everything that you shared today. Incredibly vital for all of us. Our heartfelt gratitude for all of your support along the way. We're excited to see you again next week. Uh, I am not the only person that wants to thank you, though. Uh, we're going to have our tech team unmute our entire audience. Everyone, please, what do you want to say to, uh, to Brian Clement? So much. Thank you. So much. <laughs>